Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Ruth Shelley, president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. This year's theme for Rotary International is Rotary Opens Opportunities. Yes, Rotary does open opportunities, and this is the last month we'll be talking about the three doors of opportunity, healing from the pandemic, economic recovery, and peace building as we strive for social justice. I anticipate that our speaker today, Dr. Rachel Salatarf of Central City Concern, will touch on all three opportunities, healing, recovery, and peace building, as she enlightens us on the complex issue of homelessness. But first, let's welcome Rotarian Bill Diaz for our reflection. Bill? Ruth, thank you so very much. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, we sometimes find inspiration where we least expect to find it, or maybe we hope to find it somewhere where it actually it re reveals itself. I don't know how many of you were at the District 5100 Zoom conference uh, this year, but I was able to attend thanks to Zoom. And one of the things that struck me at that conference was a speech that was given by the first major speaker in which he talked about transformative lives, how a life can be transformed from one of abject failure to absolute success and positivity. And it struck me that he said, if you start living your life with a sense of permanent purpose, a sense of permanent purpose where everything matters, everything counts, then things start to be transformed around you. And as you work in this area, the world around you begins to be a better place. And you find that uh, uh, not only is your life improved, but the lives of those around you are improved. And as a Rotarian, I'm happy to say that with the service above self ethic we have here, many of us already share that, but I wanna encourage you if you're looking for success in your life, live a life of permanent purpose. Thank you. I love that idea, Bill. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to volunteer to give the reflection, Siobhan has just put the link in the chat or you can email her directly. Now I'd like to ask that Rotarians who have invited a guest to raise their real or virtual hand and Carol will call on you to unmute and introduce them. Or if you're a visiting Rotarian who came on your own, please raise your hand and introduce yourself or let us know of your presence via the chat box. Carol, do we have any guests today? I do not see any hands raised. Will is raising his hand. There you are. Hi, Will. Who's your guest? Hi, I would like to introduce uh, Karen Rasmussen She as a guest today. She is the interim CFO of Central City Concern and uh, we're, on a, we're in a group together and, and welcome, to, really happy to have her here. Thank you. Terrific, welcome, Carrie. Any others, Carol? Nope, I'm scanning through there and no other hands are raised. Well, we welcome all of our current Rotarians and Carrie, a special welcome to you. And now it's time for birthdays. Many of you know I have a Dalai Lama calendar and the quote today was, Every day is a new opportunity to begin again. Every day is your birthday. But of course we want to honor those people who have been specifically born in June. And there's the list here. If you have a chance, please reach out to them with your best wishes. If your birthday is today, you share your birthday with Lisa Del Giacondo. Now you may wonder who is Lisa Del Giacondo? Well, she was born in 17, 1479, and you may know her better as the subject of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. So the Lisa of Mona Lisa was born today. You can all practice your secret birthday smiles. And moving on, please welcome past president, Rotarian Dev Dion to announce an upcoming volunteer opportunity. Dev? If you could unmute. I was on there mute. <laughs> on behalf of the Planet Earth Committee and Don Livingstone, uh, we, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I would like to announce a uh, city cleanup project 
uh, that Don is coordinating with Saul. The date is July 5th, and it will be over in Southeast Portland. Uh, you can uh, send questions to Don either through uh, Corinne and Soban or directly to Don uh, to get signed up. So please consider helping clean up our city. Thank you. Thank you, Dev. Certainly an important effort right now would be a great way to wind down after the 4th of July. And now we're going to disappear and enter a virtual table talk. Please introduce yourselves to the others in your group. And a minute or so before you come back to this main meeting, you'll get a visual heads up. Now we always seem to have plenty to talk about, but thinking about today's presentation, here's an idea. What does the word home mean to you? Here we go. Now on to our program. After our speaker today is finished, if you'd like to ask a question, Carol will moderate the Q&A through the chat box. And now please welcome Rotarian Will Nolan as today's chair of the day. Will? Hello, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Rachel Solotaroff to our Rotary meeting. She is the president and CEO of Central City Concern, a position she has held since October of 2017. Prior to that, she was the chief medical officer um, of the CCC Old Town Clinic, uh, where she had been since 2006 as both a chief medical officer and uh, medical director. Uh, Dr. Solotaroff is a graduate of Brown University and uh, of the Dartmouth Medical School. And she completed her residency in internal medicine at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. And if that wasn't enough, she earned a master's degree in clinical psychology or clinical research from OHSU. And she will be speaking to us today about the incredibly complex topic of homelessness, the root causes, and specifically about homelessness in Portland. CCC has been at the forefront of this issue since the 1970s, starting as an alcohol recovery center, and has grown to include not just substance abuse, but also housing and employment solutions. I am really looking forward to hearing Dr. Solotaroff's insights from such a unique vantage point. So with that, fellow Rotarians and guests, please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Rachel Solotaroff. Oh, great. Thank you, Will. It's great to be here, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm coming at you. My house is very um, gamey these days. There's a lot happening in there. So I'm here at my office coming at you live from the uh, corner of 6th and Everett here in Old Town. So if there's a little background noise, it's meant to be atmospheric, um, kind of reflecting the community that we'll be talking about today. Um, Siobhan, are you driving the slides? Do you want to bring up the slides here? And we'll get started. Um, so again, this is a real pleasure to be here. Um, and whoop, let's go back a bit. Perfect, yeah. So we'll talk about um, homelessness in Portland, um, root causes and solutions. That is a meaty topic to cover in 20 or 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to approach this at a, at a pretty high level. And then let's try to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. I think that's where we can get into some of the more granular issues. So next. So here's what we'll try to do um, is to give a brief overview of um, homelessness in Portland, but then, you know, with any complex problem, the way I always think about it is break it down into its component parts. So we'll try to really understand some of the root causes, both on the individual side um, and structural side. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk more about what that means and then move into um, kind of how Central City Concern organize itself, organizes itself in solutions to ending homelessness. Um, and I was also asked to talk a bit about um, the impact of COVID on, on homelessness, on our organization, um, on CCC's response, but frankly, more broadly on the community's response, which has been pretty awesome. Next slide. So I always like to give a few um, disclosures of where I'm, where I'm coming from in this work. And it really comes from being on the ground. I'm kind of literally here on the ground floor um, for about 15 years. And I'd say I, 
work in a really privileged space in a way of trying to figure out pragmatic solutions that focus on this, what I believe to be very achievable goal of ending homelessness. And this can be complicated, it can take time, it can take resources. And I don't, um, I, I don't envy my colleagues in the political sphere um, who are elected officials and must respond more exigently. We certainly try to meet immediate need, but also part of our goal is thinking about long-term um, solutions. Um, I also think that there, this is a big tent. There is no one right answer to how we approach this problem. And there's, um, there's a lot of different people. There's a lot of different ways to approach this issue. And, and my view is that um, there's room in that tent for everyone. And finally, this idea that doing things the right way is as important as doing the right thing. To me, what that means is having the voices at the table, both to gather input and to make the decisions, um, that those voices need to be there, often the voices of people with lived experience and the people who are impacted by the decision having a voice in it. So that'll inform a little bit of what we'll talk about today. Okay, next slide. So just thought I'd start with a quick snapshot of, and again, these data are old, I'll explain why in a second, but of where we roughly are um, in terms of the um, homeless prevalence in Multnomah County. And the point in time count is one that many, you know, all communities that receive HUD funding um, do every two years, if not more frequently. Um, we did not do one in 2021. Um, the idea is also you sort of go out on a given night, usually in the winter time, and count the number of people who are um, in transitional housing, in shelter, or in outdoors in a space not suitable for human habitation. And we didn't do one in 2021 from um, uh, because of COVID, but my guess is the trends would only increase. So you can see there on that top blue line that the total homeless count as of 2019 had actually remained relatively stable, roughly around 4,000 people, give or take a few. But we did see some marked changes in 2019 compared to 2017. We saw more people um, in the homeless population that were unsheltered, meaning they're not in, they're not in a transitional housing, they're not in shelter, they're on the street. That was up nearly 25% from 2017. And we see year upon year, and we'll talk more about this, that people of color are overrepresented in the homeless population. Um, we saw in the 2019 count that more people are experiencing chronic homelessness, which has a pretty complex de definition by, um, from HUD, um, but really that they've been homeless for a year um, uh, for one year continuously or more than, um, or cumulatively over a three year period. And that nearly more than two thirds of those people who are unsheltered report one or more disabling conditions that can be from mental health, addiction, or, um, or physical health. So the news there, which might not come as a surprise to you is that the people who are homeless are more often outdoors. Um, they're more often there for long periods of time and they're sicker. Next slide. So how did we get here? What drives homelessness? And I found this article of this kind of construct in the Lancet of all places, a medical journal. And I've kind of adapted it over time, but I haven't found anything better. So I think of this idea, and so does this article about the drivers of homeless, homelessness as being on the individual side Maybe, and I think of it not as individual choice or fault, but individual experience versus factors that are structural, that are baked into our, the way our society works and take a lot of intentional effort to change. So you can see on the individual factor slide, some of the like statistically significant factors that drive homelessness are adverse childhood experiences, meaning trauma in childhood, serious mental illness, substance use disorder, um, a personal history of violence, which also results in traumatic brain injury, which is another big factor. And age, as of several years ago, age greater than 50 is in and of itself an independent risk factor um, for homelessness. And then on the structural side, and we'll talk through some of these because they're so important, is the absence of affordable housing, the absence of meaningful wage employment, 
systemic and structural racism and discrimination, and, I, and interaction with the criminal justice system, which I think of as, um, as a structural factor because of how that system works. And there are two key points here. You know, um, one is that homelessness is very complex and dynamic. The structural factors may influence individual factors, which may reinforce people's homelessness as well. Structural factors drive homelessness. But the bigger takeaway point is as a little asterisk there in the bottom right, which is that evidence has shown that as these structural factors become more pronounced, that individuals, with fewer individual vulnerabilities, you need fewer and fewer of those individual factors to drive someone into homelessness and keep them there. And we don't think that way in this country. We often think, gosh, if someone tried harder, you know, if they went to more appointments, if they, um, you know, took this medicine, um, saw this counselor, they'd be able to get themselves out of this. But I think this is a really important slide to note that those things, those individual factors, those, those individual experiences and people's ability to remedy those are, um, are overwhelmed by structural factors. And I'll give you an example of that shortly. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So because these structural factors are so important, um, I thought I'd spend just a few minutes diving into them and there are reams of data on all of these, but I'll just give you a slide on a few. And I don't think it comes as a surprise to any of you that we have an affordable housing crisis, not just in our city and our county, um, but also really in the state of Oregon. So, um, and we'll come at this from two different angles today. The, both of these slides are from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which is a terrific resource. And the, the uh, map there on the left looks at the availability of affordable housing for extremely low income renters or ELI. And ELI by definition refers to people who have income at or below the poverty level or at 30% or less of median family income, MFI. And here in um, Multnomah County, 30% MFI amounts to about $24,000 family income per year for a family of four or $15,400 per year for a single person. And if you, the diagram shows the number of rental homes that are both available and affordable for every 100 ELI, extremely low income renters in the state. And you can see that Port or uh, Oregon there um, is in the red um, with less than 30 homes available. And it's just worth noting that across the United States overall, extremely low income renters in the US overall face a shortage of actually 7 million affordable and available rental homes. And that's even I think pre COVID data. So there's work to do there in the building and financing and operating of uh, deeply affordable housing for this population. And then on the right is the circumstances of income. And this just gives you a little better sense, this blue diagram of what wage is required to rent a two bedroom apartment at fair market without paying more than 30% of one's income on rent. And given the housing affordability crisis in, uh, in Oregon, somebody in Portland needs to pay, what is it there, 24, they need to make $24.37 an hour to be able to reasonably afford um, a two bedroom apartment at fair market. Um, and I don't know if you saw it, there was a terrific article that some colleagues of mine helped to work on in the Oregonian over the weekend, I think called Teetering, Teetering on the Edge and talking about how um, homeless services providers, the people doing work to support homelessness, um, both in the case management world and, and outreach and engagement and also in behavioral health um, are often um, at or below this threshold. So we can talk about more of this in the Q&A section, but really the workforce itself is at jeopardy of experiencing homelessness because of the affordability crisis. Um, okay, next slide. So we mentioned meaningful wage employment also as a um, key structural driver of homelessness. And 
just some quick diagrams and you can have all of these slides in case you want to study them more closely. Um, but the data on the left from the Oregon Office of Economic Analysis looked at how wages between 2017 and 2016 um, were changing in the Portland metro area. And basically you can see that there was a pretty rapid growth in high wage um, employment and a somewhat more modest but still decent growth in low wage um, jobs in Portland, but there's actually a slowing down, a kind of a hollowing out of middle wage income opportunities in our community. And these, particularly for the folks that, um, that we serve, these middle wage jobs are critical for people who experience homelessness because we can really get people started at entry levels with lots of training and some flexibility and then support them moving into these middle wage, meaningful wage employments. And then these data are from last summer, but I don't, on the right hand side, I don't suspect they've changed um, appreciably sort of what the impact of COVID has been on our, on our lowest wage workers. And you can see the blue and the, the green lines, people were bouncing back last summer if, um, in terms of their hourly wages, if they made in the high or middle tercile. But people of lower incomes were not bouncing back. Um, a much slower economic recovery, um, which is expected to persist for several years. Okay, this will get more, it'll, it always, this part's such a, it feels heavy, but we're gonna get to some solutions. It's gonna, it's gonna feel better shortly. Um, let's go to the next one though. This is a really critical piece that we focus on a lot. I have really brilliant, um, colleagues um, in the community and at, uh, and at CCC, really focusing in on you, racial disparities and homelessness. And you really can't talk about homelessness without, without talking about racism. Um, and these, this is from the National Alliance to End Homelessness, these data. And you can see those bars um, across the top there. And they're pretty striking that you look at the percentage of people of um, different, um, racial background, and then below in terms of ethnic background, the, their prevalence in the US population compared to their prevalence in the homelessness population. And this is, um, this is true in, um, in Portland as well. There's a number of drivers here. Um, one of them is just intergenerational poverty, particularly uh, deep poverty. Um, Black and Latinx groups are definitely more overrepresented in poverty compared to um, the general population. There is a long history of segregation and housing discrimination in this country, in this city, um, with use of um, uh, policies and practices like redlining, which discouraged economic investments such as mortgage and business loans in black and brown communities. Um, incarceration, I touched on this earlier, is a structural driver in and of itself of homelessness, that the racial disparity of inca in incarceration has actually just continued to worsen year upon year. And I have to check my notes for a second, but the rate of African Americans um, incarcerated has tripled between 1968 and 2016. It's more than six times the rate of white incarceration. And it, it, I will just take a moment and say, if you've ever seen or had the opportunity to read um, The New Jim Crow, it gives a really powerful structural analysis of how incarceration perpetuates homelessness among people of color um, for years to come. So really a, a powerful read. And then um, access to quality health care is another root cause. People of color are more likely to lack health insurance than white people. And that's particularly true in states without, medication exp without Medicaid expansion, which um, fortunately in our state, we don't experience. Um, but overall in this country, about 30 million people are uninsured and about half of those are people of color. So those are those structural drivers. I think it's really important to ground ourselves in those both um, so that we can understand the kind of depth and gravity of what's driving our homelessness crisis, um, but then also opportunities to, to make really meaningful change. So let's go on to the next slide. And I'll tell you a little bit about Central City Concern. Um, just checking my time here. So um, 
Central City Concern, as Will noted, has been around for about 40 years. Um, and even though things, our, our mission is to provide comprehensive solutions to ending homelessness, and even though things have really evolved somewhat organically over the years, it, um, the organization really does address solutions to homelessness predicated on both addressing these individual needs, but also attending to these structural factors. Um, so first is that we provide um, supportive and affordable housing. And Siobhan, click next, because these are animated. I'll see if this works. Yeah, so I'll tell you a bit about this in a moment, but we um, provide direct access to housing um, in often therapeutic environments, but also really indexed to the needs of the population. There is not just one housing solution that, um, that will solve all the um, variable needs among people experiencing homelessness. Um, we provide integrated health care, so you can go next on that one. And the, the idea, we, we talk a lot about being trauma-informed. I can say this as a physician, there is a lot of trauma that happens um, within the provision of medical care, and I feel really grateful to work in a place like Central City Concern, which um, by no means is, perf is perfect, um, but really does work in approaching integrated health care across primary care, mental health, addictions care in a way that is non-judgmental, um, is indexed to the needs of the population and just really meets people where they are. Um, income and employment, you can click next on that. So I always think of the attainment of income, um, which can be through employment. Um, it can be through accessing benefits. Um, I think of this as one of the, I don't wanna say unsung heroes to any of my employment, supported employment colleagues out there, cause I think we, we should, we, we sing it loudly, but um, uh, supportive employment is one of the most cost effective interventions that we have for ending homelessness. Um, it may cost, you know, a few thousand dollars a year um, to provide an employment um, opportunity to someone, which then enables them to continue their employment, to become rent responsible, to need less rent assistance possibly. Um, I've seen as a physician, people's health outcomes soar. It is, um, it doesn't get as much attention, I think, as the other areas. And I just wanted to take a minute to, to highlight how important I think it is. And then finally is the, um, what I call the, the special sauce of Central City Concern, which is peer support. And this idea that relationships with one another, particularly relationships with people who have the same experience as you that can support personal transformation and recovery. You know, someone who's like, I understand, I've been there as well. Um, here's what I did to get out of it. Here's what it might look like for you two or three years from now. Here, let me take you, you know, I guess you don't take people by the arm anymore take people by the elbow and kind of lead them to, um, you know, a place where they might need to go. It's, um, it's pretty remarkable at CCC that nearly half of our staff have some lived experience um, themselves of homelessness, of serious mental illness, of addiction, of incarceration. Um, and these staff serve as, you know, sometimes they do direct, direct clinical service and sometimes they don't but serve as role models and mentors to other staff like myself um, who don't share that experience. So I can't say enough about how foundational that is to our culture and to our work. Let's go on to the next slide. Check my time here, doing good. So here's just a quick snapshot of our, um, of our impact. So we have about 2,000 and counting um, homes across 27 properties um, in the metro area. And as I mentioned earlier, there is no single housing solution. Some people want to be in um, uh, community housing that is alcohol and drug free if they're on a, a journey of recovery. Some people say, you know what, if you tell me I have to stop drinking or using to come indoors, I'm never going to do it. And so there's opportunity for low barrier, what we call housing first housing. Um, some people will need permanent supportive housing. 
you know, maybe for a couple of years, maybe for 10 years, maybe for a lifetime, but not everybody needs permanent supportive housing. And it's, that would be really expensive. Um, so some people can stay in um, transitional housing or stabilization housing for six or eight months and coupled with some um, other services and employment support they would, can move out into the community after that. And then um, we also do, we have a number of programs, particularly given that acute driver of incarceration as a, as a driver of homelessness, housing specifically for people who are exiting corrections. Um, and so all told, we house about 4,000 people a year. Um, we provide um, also integrated healthcare and there's, it's a long list there. Um, uh, but serve that to about 9,000 people um, per year, again, across primary care, across mental health, um, across addiction services, both inpatient, um, resident, inpatient detox, residential and outpatient. Um, there's a wonderful legacy of um, uh, Eastern and naturopathic um, treatment um, for the homeless community at Central City Concern, particularly for substance use disorders, which I'm really privileged to work with, and, and pharmacy services as well. And finally, I think I, I talked a bit about our employment services already. So this gives you kind of a snapshot. Um, a couple things that aren't on here that I do just want to highlight. One is the importance in each of these areas of providing services that are culturally specific, that maybe or culturally responsive even. So um, one of our programs is uh, called the Amani Center run by, well, it's a long, it's a beautiful long story. They don't have time to go into, but it provides culturally specific, actually Afrocentric um, behavioral health care to black and African-American um, clients and really says, you know, mainstream um, outpatient mental health and addiction services don't work for this population. Um, we need to have different curriculum that, that look at things like um, historical oppression and trauma and post-traumatic slave syndrome and all these other things that figure into someone's current experience um, that are rooted um, in history and in culture. Um, we have a culturally specific program called Puentes, um, which provides behavioral health care for um, Latinx um, families. And we don't do a lot of family services at CCC, but again, culturally, the family is integral um, to the Latinx population. And so that's how they wanted those services to be delivered. And we do a program also called Flip the Script. It's a culturally specific program for people exiting incarceration, working specifically on advocacy with parole and probation, as well as housing and employment services. And I think the last point I would make about our, um, our services is that these look like snapshots in kind of different domains, but the real magic happens when you braid these services together. I could, if I've learned anything, well, that's an exaggerated, I guess I've learned a couple things, but the, the idea that no solution to homelessness exists in a vacuum is a really critical thing to remember. You can't just stand up a shelf, you can, but you're gonna get um, uh, sort of declining outcomes if you just stand up a shelter or stand up some housing units or hang out a shingle doing behavioral health. Those things are all good, but if the goal is to end someone's homelessness, it's how you weave those services together um, and if needed culturally specifically for a given population where you start to see better client experience, you know, because they don't have to navigate all that. You see better outcomes because these things work better together than they do separately. And frankly, you see wiser stewardship of the dollar, whether that's a public dollar, a donated dollar, a nonprofit dollar, because these investments, when they work together, they leverage one another um, and can actually, I don't have time to show you data, but can actually reduce costs in other parts of the system. Okay, so that's kind of how CCC works. If we had more time, I can I could dive into some of these programs specifically, but that's a broad overview. Um, let's go on and I will wrap up here pretty shortly. 
So if we just, just to give you again, just a snapshot of a day in the life, this is right outside the Old Town Clinic um, where I've practiced for about 15 years, I still do. And just for those of you in healthcare, just to give you a little sense of who's walking in the door, let's say at Old Town on a given day, that over three fourths of them have had one or more episodes of homelessness. That 50% of these folks have an active substance use disorder, right? That is bigger than the people who have diabetes and hypertension, you know, from a prevalence standpoint. And that half of these folks also have virtually no resources at their disposal. They have a monthly household income of less than $100. So let's go on to the next slide. And <clears throat> I wanted to cap off this description of CCC um, with a really uplifting story of one of our fantastic um, now employees at CCC, a fellow named Ralph, who came through a lot of these programs and, and, um, and how they all knit together um, to um, kind of build, build off of Ralph's kind of difficult childhood and, and substance use um, and utilizing these different services to produce this obviously exuberant, effusive individual you see before you. But I'm going to change, I'm going to go off script for a second because something powerful happened over the weekend. I got an email um, popped up in my inbox on Sunday morning and the subject line just said, my son. It chokes me up a little bit, I think as a parent. And um, it was from a, a woman and she had seen that I was coming to speak to the Rotary Club today. And she said, you know, I'm, a, I'm from Delaware, but I raised my children in Southeastern Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia area, as well as lived in Austin, and is a many, many year proud Rotarian, never missed a meeting for 15 years until she had a breast cancer diagnosis later on. And she wanted me to know that her son, Steve, sleeps in a tent, he's 39 years old, sleeps in a tent right around the corner from that picture that I just showed you. And she wanted to make sure that, that this community in the Rotary Club understood Steve's story and that he was a, he's a real smart man, um, had three years of college, speaks fluent German. They lived in Germany for a while. And then at the age of 27, had his first psychotic episode, um, was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder and has been in and out of hospitals and on and off the streets ever since. Um, and, you know, and, and so she said, can I talk to you? So we all sat down here in this office yesterday afternoon and I had an opportunity to meet Steve. And what struck me so much about his uh, story is that it's back to this housing as a structural issue. He hasn't been able to successfully find a housing environment that works for him. He was evicted from his last um, housing, which was low, pretty low barrier housing because of noise complaints. And to his credit, he was fun. He said, yeah, it wasn't once or twice. It was like two or 300 times. Um, but he is on, at the top of a waiting list for another housing um, uh, property. Um, but it's been five or six months and he's been in the tent ever since. And so just kind of understanding what are these gaps either in having enough of, you know, housing for someone like Steve or even opportunities for transitional housing. Um, that really struck me. And um, this woman, Sue, she said, you know, the, she said, these are our members of, I'll just read her words to me. She's the members of the Rotary Club um, are leaders who can help turn Portland into a community of people who understand and care for their brothers and sisters who are living on the street and can work together to lift them up and out of their current situations. And it was so resonant, I couldn't agree more hearing at the opening of the program here about your, your precepts of healing and, um, and recovery. So I think she was kind of reaching across the country um, to talk to you today and to share Steve's story. So I am at 1250. I know there were questions about COVID, but I really wanted to, um, to leave time for some dialogue here as well as to take that opportunity to share Steve's story. So um, I'm gonna say one last thing. I just wanna show you, if we can advance just a couple slides, Siobhan, I just wanna show you all um, looking ahead because we've been talking about housing um, 
and one more, one more. Yeah, that there is, you know, you all in this community, we've um, funded lots of opportunities through the through the Metro bond, um, uh, the city bond to build uh, deeply affordable housing with services such as that that someone like Steve needs. And so here's just a quick snapshot of some of the housing that we have in the pipeline. Um, including um, housing that's particularly for people with serious mental illness, housing for people, this transitional housing for people in early recovery, um, and culturally specific housing, um, partnering with the Boys and Girls Club as well as with the Native American Recovery Association. So there are lots of, you know, we'll make a dent, we'll keep working on this, um, lots of opportunities for these kinds of integrated innovative solutions. Um, uh, for the problems we've been describing. And just two more quick slides. I'll just leave, just click ahead one and one more, Siobhan. Great. That's our website. That's our social media stuff that I'm too old to understand. And there's my email though, if you ever want to uh, reach out and, and connect directly, I'd be privileged, I'd be honored. All right, thank you so much. I think thank I've left you, us Rachel. a little time. Thank you, Rachel. What a provocative, meaningful presentation. I know that we've got some questions already in the queue, and I'm going to turn it over to Carol to, to uh, facilitate the Q&A. Carol? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Rachel, great presentation. I know that we connect with um, your organization a lot. Yeah. So happy to have you here on Rotary. Um, Leslie Brunker has a question. Leslie? Yes, hi, Rachel, hey. so happy to see you. I, I'm a longtime supporter of oh. Central City Concern and was Thank at you. the event when they announced that you were coming on. And oh. so anyway, happy Thank to you, see Liz. you. <laughs> appreciate that, appreciate that a lot. Really good organization. Um, so I, my question is about, um, in your slide it said 51% were, um, addressing substance abuse of an active and mm -hmm. and so how do you address those who aren't willing or aren't ready to quit but still need and want services and want to get on that road i love that question thank you and thanks leslie for your support um so there is a it is not a new practice um there is a whole body with, of work in substance use um, treatment called harm reduction. It might not be the best title, but it's predicated on the idea that everybody deserves access to um, uh, treatment services, regardless of what their goals around, um, you know, abstinence should be. So, um, sometimes that might just be, okay, can, you know, that's where things like needle exchanges might come in. Let's, or, you know, let's just make sure even, let's just make sure you're not contracting hep C or now we even can treat people with hep C who have an active substance use disorder. I think it's also really important to note in the field of substance use that it's a spectrum disorder, right? It's not black and white. So let's say for alcohol use disorder, there is mild, there is moderate, and there is severe. Um, and so going from a severe alcohol use disorder where you do heavy drinking every day, let's say of the week, to where you drink heavily only two or three days of a week, that is success. Yeah. Um, and Bill Miller, the brilliant psychologist who developed motivational interviewing said this, I heard him speak once and he gave this line, I'll never forget. He said, you know, addiction is the only disease where anything less than perfection is considered failure. Yeah. And I think that's really, you know, I've seen people who are still using some and are they back to work? Yes. Are they housed? Yes. You know, are they caring yeah. for, are they in caring relationships? Yes. So I think kind of keeping that spectrum and that harm reduction construct in mind is real helpful. Great. Great. That's a really good answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is awful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill, you have a question for Rachel? Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah, and uh, sure. nice one of the you. areas that I stumbled on um, out at Roosevelt High School was the number of homeless teens who are high school students, something I didn't have when we went to Roosevelt. And 
are you doing anything in the area of helping the homeless teen who, I guess there's quite a few of them in the Portland area. Mm -hmm. So is that una what, what they would technical term, unaccompanied youth are these homeless yeah, teens? Yeah, 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 unaccompanied okay. youth, right, who are couch surfing or just trying to survive. Yeah, so CCC does less of that um, in part we, um, because Outside In, which is an organization similar to ours, similar to ours, provides housing and integrated health care. Um, Outside In does a fantastic job. In fact, having um, uh, Patricia Padron, their uh, executive director, might be really helpful in that regard at some point. Um, and I think the whole model of care is actually, it's very different. It is culturally specific when you're working um, with youth and they use a lot of, you know, uh, I think there's probably a very different style and approach than we do at CCC. So um, uh, I think that there, I think we still need to work on um, housing solutions um, specifically for that population. Um, I think saying take those homeless teens and put them in a, you know, housing first building with a bunch of other 30 and 40 year olds probably makes less sense. So um, that seems to be an area of development that I that I've um, that I've noted. And I think a place like outside in provides excellent care models, but just probably like everything just needs to be scaled. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ruth, you had a question? Well, we are almost at time, but Rachel, if you could, I know that you didn't have time to delve into the impact of COVID on sure. your work. Yeah. But I was wondering in a minute or two, if you could just say what has been the most significant factor of COVID on your work? Hey, I think we just, I have to take 90 seconds to talk about the people mm -hmm. who do who do the work. Um, I think the stress on our, I, I don't wanna underestimate and, and not underscore um, the difficulties around hunger and isolation and difficulty with ab accessing telehealth and what have you among our clients. But I had the privilege of being able to talk with some colleagues from the Morrison Center in our breakout room and the stress on our staff has been enormous. Um, and this was, this was a stressed system. And then we applied a stress test to it, to use a medical analogy. And I think it's more than a lot of our staff. Um, I and mean, they hang in there, um, but it is really hard. It's been hard on them economically. It's been hard on them from an emotional um, resilience standpoint, hard in terms of being able to balance the demands of being at home um, at times with, um, with who is uh, with with what they're taking care of, we have not, as a system, appropriately funded the workforce from a compensation standpoint, and frankly, haven't funded the infrastructure to be able to give them the professional development, the leadership, loan repayment, all those things uh, that they need. That I think maybe in other environments they would have more ready access to. So I didn't want to leave today without recognizing that extraordinary group of people and, and how hard this has been. Thank you, Ruth. I'm so you. glad you took that opportunity because we do need to remember the staff and it may be that I know that staff support and infrastructure is going to be an issue even post COVID. That might be one of those structural factors that gets yes. added to Great. your slide. Mm. Oh, taking that one home. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rachel, and thank all of you Rotarians for your thoughtful questions. Next week, our speaker is fellow Rotarian Tyler Wright, who is the CEO of the YMCA of the Columbia Willamette. And Tyler will describe an initiative to emphasize water safety for overlooked groups. This is an exceptionally relevant summer topic, and I hope you all tune in. Remember that if you have a speaker idea, please submit them on our website and Siobhan will put a link in the chat. And now it's my time to thank all, all of you for coming and a special thanks to Carrie for joining us today. Bill, thank you for your reflection. We're all going to try to remember our permanent purpose. Dev, appreciate that invitation to join the Solve Cleanup event on July 5th. And Will, thank you for your, for your speaker introduction of Rachel. Rachel, thank you again for your informative talk. 
I always appreciate a data-driven presentation that also offers solutions. And I think we as Rotarians all saw our role as part of those solutions. Steve's story was especially moving and I'm really glad that you shared it. Now, before we close, I want to wish all of you fathers on the screen a happy Father's Day on Sunday. One of my favorite quotes about fatherhood is by Howard Hunter, who said, one of the greatest things a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Something, something to think about. One of the greatest things a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Now, as we enter into a new Rotary Week, please join me in opening the doors of opportunity for healing, for recovery, and for peace building. As Rotarians, we are here to make our world healthier, more sustainable, and with justice for all. Have a good week, everyone, a wonderful weekend, and this meeting, if I can get to my bell, is adjourned. My bell is currently unavailable. There we go. Now we can say goodbye. Take care, everyone.